today we're going to finish our very brief study of Abraham. I hope these messages have whetted your appetite, if you will, uh, for a more thorough and intensive study of Abraham because there's so much there. There's so much meat on the bone, so to speak. Um, as I've said, it took our Sunday school class over a year to study Abraham uh, in chapters 12 through 26 of Genesis. Um, I don't know that you can ever deplete all that the Lord has for us there, but I'm going to ask uh, Tony to put a picture up. Uh, actually, there are only two pictures for her over or through with this, but these are two well-known men, or at least they used to be well-known. I'm not for sure about that anymore. Um, who, who is this, and who are they? Who is the first one? Okay, that tells us a little about the age of our audience this morning. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, that picture hung in every schoolroom in, in school. And I guess they removed George with the Bible a few years ago. You don't see George Washington too much. Um, and the other fella, and uh, since we have such a, a smart congregation, I know that you've noticed the title of the message it has to do with Abraham, and I'm sure you have used some deductive reasoning that this is a picture of what some people believe that Abraham may have looked like. Now, George Washington, we, we know what he looked like. There are paintings of him. In fact, that was a picture of a painting. But uh, this one is just uh, put together, I think, from because they didn't have photographers or artists that followed people around uh, 4,000 years ago. But uh, indeed, that is Abraham. And these guys have a few things in common uh, than besides being formerly famous. Um, both of them are often referred to as fathers of something. Uh, George Washington is often referred to as the father of our, our nation or our country, yes. And uh, Abraham's often referred to as the father of our faith. Very good. In fact, Scripture backs that up. I, that isn't some coin or some phrase that we've just added. Uh, if you were to turn to Romans 4.16, you don't need to do that. But there's a Scripture there that verifies that he is the father of our faith. At the end of that verse, it says, those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So, besides being known as fathers of something, uh, both of these men had some things in common too. Both believed in Yahweh Elohim. Don't hear that too much from the pulpit, do we, these days? I bet you're going to hear some more of that in days to come. But that means the one and only God of the universe. Yahweh Elohim. And both of these men believed in Yahweh Elohim. Both were blessed by God providentially. In fact, uh, Tony put the picture up of uh, George Washington at Valley Forge. This is a very famous painting. And I want to thank Mary publicly. She got a big print of this for me. And it hangs in my office at the courthouse in Oklahoma City. In fact, I put it up with a little trepidation. I wondered if it would offend some people, but I don't care because I want the testimony to be that George Washington was a man of God, and he was led by God. And um, I could give a whole sermon on George Washington, uh, but his aides often found him at the foot of his cot in his tent of a morning praying and reading Scripture. We sometimes forget that, or we don't hear that anymore. But uh, both of these men, Abraham and God, were blessed by God and were providentially led by God in the forming of their countries or their nations. Abraham, of course, was the father of the Hebrew nation, where the Jews come from, modern-day Israelites. And um, then George Washington, being the father of our uh, country, the father of our nation, was highly involved in the Revolutionary War, a key figure in that. And they were also both mighty military men. I, I, I don't know that I should say mighty military men, but they were both military men. George Washington was known by most people in his day as General Washington. More people knew him by General Washington than they did uh, President Washington. And um, in his military record uh, is backed up in our U.S. history about the battles and the, and the soldiers that he led. Uh, Abraham could also be called a military man. He one time defeated an army of five kings and all their soldiers with just 318 men that he trained. You can find that over in chapter 14 of Genesis. It's a neat story. But one thing that George Washington um, will never have in common with Abraham or will never be known for, as great as he was, 
is that he is not included in the pages of the Holy Bible. Um, of course, the Holy Bible came about two millennia after he was here, uh, or before he was here. Um, but uh, as ma- great a man as George Washington was, he probably couldn't hold a candle to Abraham, spiritually speaking. Um, Abraham is not only prominently mentioned in the Bible, but he's one of the most important people in all of the Bible. And lest you say I'm embellishing or, or uh, bolstering that, as we like to say in court, uh, Genesis 12.3 says, And in you, this is God talking to Abraham, says, In you all families of the earth will be blessed. So he was a very important man. In part one of our mini-series of messages on Abraham, which we, I think, did on April the 8th, I said that it was through Abraham that uh, God shows us that it's his desire and it's his longing to have a deep, personal, intimate, meaningful relationship uh, with us. One where we're totally and unwaveringly dependent upon him for anything and everything in our lives. And through that relationship, God not not only meets our physical and our emotional and our spiritual needs, but... He really blesses us beyond all imagination, more than we can dream of or think of. Um, Not what the world can give us, but what our walk with the Lord Jesus and our obedience to God the Father can give us, which is a fulfilling, a satisfying, a meaningful life, which in the end, isn't that what everybody's looking for? Uh, God makes this clear from the very beginning of Scripture because the story of Abraham from his calling of God starts in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. Chapter 11 is when and where we see him first mentioned. And right out of the chute, right at the get-go, God wants to make it clear that he seeks this deep, intimate relationship with us. To walk with him as he had intended to have walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. In the account of Abram, only later to be known as Abraham, um, God changes his name over in chapter 17, verse 5, I believe. But in the account of Abram, God provides us with a blueprint, a pattern, um, a template or a model of how God grows us and how He matures us spiritually in our walk with the Lord. And remember, God called Abram from a heathen idol-worshiping people and brought him to what is modern-day Israel and molded him into not only a blessed man who we call the father of our faith, but he grew so close and intimate to God, so close and intimate with the Lord, that God called Abraham affectionately his friend. That's in James 2.23. And the scripture is fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or reckoned unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What an attribute. Then we took note of that having the kind of relationship with God that he seeks with us is probably going to be a lifelong process in reality. We saw in Abraham's life, how growing and maturing in our walk with the, with the Lord isn't an overnight one and done thing. It's more like two steps forward and one backwards, or God forbid, sometimes one step forward and two backwards. Remember the example we looked at and which were given at the very beginning of Abraham's spiritual journey. There was a famine in the land and Abraham fled to Egypt without so much as even seeking the Lord's guidance. He learned there while he was in Egypt a very serious lesson about not seeking the Lord, didn't he? It almost cost him his life and it almost landed Sarah in Pharaoh's bed. But God saved him, rescued him, delivered him. However, there were some lingering consequences to Abraham's sin of not seeking the Lord. Because while he was down in Egypt, being out of the Lord's will, they acquired an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. And they brought her back with them to the promised land, and she would be a source of grief to him for the rest of his life. And we concluded that first message with a look at a mountaintop experience, because I didn't want to end on a bad note, because there are good things and bad things. If you were to do a chart of Abraham's spiritual life, it looks like a mountain range. He's up here, he's down here. So I wanted to end with a good note, and we took a look at one of those mountaintop experiences, spiritually speaking, when in chapter 15, God appeared to Abraham and made a covenant with him, and he told him, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And he took Abram outside and he said, 
Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Remember, Abraham is an old man, no kids. And then we get what may be the most important verse in all the Scripture relating to Abraham at least. In verse 6 of chapter 15 where we're told, Then he believed in the Lord, and he, God, reckoned it to him as righteousness. And on this side of the cross, we'd say that that verse marks when Abraham was born again and trusted the Lord as his Savior. Very important verse. Uh, when you get to that. In fact, uh, J. Vernon McGee says it's the most important verse in all of the verses about Abraham because that when we can point to definitively that he came to know the Lord as his Savior. Then in part two of our mini-series on Abraham, which was the very next week, tax day, April 15th, we saw Abraham's faith had grown through the trials and the tribulations that he had had and his learning to lean on the Lord and to seek the Lord in all that he did. His faith had grown so much that like we see in the New Testament with regard to Simon Peter and the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul, that God changed his name from Abram to Abraham to fit his faith. The changed man that he had become. Abraham meaning father of many nations. Bear in mind at the time that he changed his name, he hadn't even had a child yet. But this new name reflected Abraham's new relationship with God. And it causes us to ask ourselves, does my walk and my relationship with the Lord warrant a name change for me? Has God changed and transformed me from the person that I was before I trusted the Lord and began walking with Him? Or or am I relatively unchanged? Same name, same old guy. God wants to change our hearts. And I really believe... Greg, you can correct me someday, not tonight. But I really believe that when we get to heaven, we may not be known by the name that we think we're known by. We may have a new name there. But the focus of that message was on the meeting that Abraham had with God and the two destroying angels who stopped by to pay Abraham a visit on their way to where? Sodom and Gomorrah to deal with the sin and the outcry that God heard from there. And what took place in chapter 18 is an incredible one-on-one personal meeting between the Lord and Abraham, which, thanks be to God, he's seen fit to let us be privy to and let us eavesdrop in on. Here we see the relationship between the Lord and Abraham so close, so personal, so intimate, that the Lord allows Abraham to intercede on behalf of his nephew Lot and Lot's family, and even to intercede on any other righteous soul that may be in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we have recorded there in Scripture a picture of what our relationship with the Lord can and should look like, where we share our most intimate thoughts and our concerns with the Lord, and He'll listen to us. And more than that, He'll communicate with us. We saw that the greatest reward or benefit for having that kind of a relationship with God is that what He will do is He will reveal more of Himself to us as we grow in Him. And He will reveal more of His will for our lives when we grow close to Him. And you remember that at the conclusion of that communion, I like to think about it because He prepared a meal for the Lord God Almighty. But at the conclusion, God informed Abraham and He says, I'll be back this time, same time next year and the son that I've been promising you, well, your wife, Sarah, even in her old age, will give you the son of my promise. Well, today, in the time that uh, we have left, I want us to look at the final test that uh, God has for Abraham to see the extent of Abraham's love for God and his willingness to trust all things to God, to trust Him in all things, his willingness to trust Him in all situations and at all times. That's all he wants, all you got. Guthrie High School football head coach Kelly Beebe, a believer himself, by the way, tells his football players before they take the field every Friday night, right before the prayer is given, right before every young man and trainer gets on their knees and offers the Lord's Prayer. He says, all I want is all you got. And Coach Beebe wants all they got so they can win a football game. But God wants all you got because He knows that's the only time that we're truly safe It's the only time we're truly fulfilled, truly happy, truly content, because He has our best interests at stake. 
He knows what's best for us more than we know what's best for us. It takes a lot of pressure off of it when you think about it that God just wants all we got. That's what He's been telling to Abraham. Turn to Genesis 22. One of the most important chapters in the Bible because it sets the stage for so much of our doctrine, our faith, and is the model of our personal relationship and our walk with the Lord, one of trust and the dependence upon God for everything. And when we come to this chapter, we witness Abraham, the father of our faith, the friend of God, take his final exam in what I like to call God's school of spiritual growth, which I like to think of as when Abram answered the call to leave Ur of the Chaldeans many, many years earlier, Abraham unbeknowingly enrolled in what he ex- when he accepted uh, that offer or that call into God's school of spiritual growth. Well, is he going to pass this test? We know he did, but we may have forgotten how hard the final exam was. But equally important for us to understand, and I want to try to make that clear this morning, is that we'll see in this chapter, in this story of Abraham offering Isaac a foreshadowing, a typology, if you will, a picture of what God would do hundreds of years later when the ultimate and supreme sacrifice would be made by God the Father and Jesus the Son, our Savior, on Calvary. Chapter 22 is where it is in the Scriptures, in the story here, is to provide and to prepare the minds of those people in the Old Testament times to understand and to see that God had a plan from the very beginning of time to redeem the loss to Himself after the fall. In short, the offering of Isaac points to the cross and to to Jesus. And on this side of the cross, as we look back, it also points to Jesus, and we can see that. And it more further gives us our confidence and trust in the Bible and in His Word. Let's take a look at Genesis 22. Let's begin with verse 1. Now, it came about after these things. Let's stop there. What things? At least 40 years had probably come and gone as God grew and matured Abraham in his faith, in his dependence, and in his reliance upon God. And it says there next that God tested Abraham. No bones about it, no hiding the ball. This was God testing Abraham to see where he was in his faith, to test his trust. Isn't that why we have tests in school? Is to see where we are. God tests us to see where we are spiritually. And then it says, and said to him, Abraham. Again, God and Abraham are now so close and so tightly knit together. After all, God has called him his friend. That God calls Abraham out, Abraham. And notice in your version of the Bible, it probably there's an explanation point after that word. Abraham. In other words, this wasn't a weak, um, soft beckoning. It was a loud, clear, audible, unmistakable, Abraham. That's how I like to think about that. And on cue, as if he's waiting to, for God to speak to him, Abraham says, here I am. And do you sense, can you read the anticipation or sense the anticipation on Abraham's part and his readiness there to be obedient to the Lord? Look at verse 2. And God said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Whoa, did we read that right? Did somebody slip some other version here in on us? God had never done such a thing, never even suggested such a thing. Not before and not since. What's this all about? I'll tell you what this is. This is the test question. The rest of the verses that we'll be looking at this morning are Abraham's answers and his responses to those questions. And let's dig a little deeper here. I want you to notice a few things. Notice, first of all, there's no doubt who it is that Abraham is being asked to sacrifice as a burning offering. His son, his only son, whom you love. And if that isn't enough, God specifically names him Isaac. In other words, not to be confused with Ishmael, whom God has already ordered Abraham to banish and send away that we read about in chapter 21. Isaac is the only son of promise. 
And then it says, offer him as a burnt offering. And bear in mind, the Jewish system of animal sacrifices hadn't even been instituted yet. That wouldn't come for another 500 years under Moses. So there's no gray area here for what God wants Abraham to do. He lays it out plain and simple. Sacrifice your son, Isaac. So let me ask you, if they're so close, where's the debate with God? Where's the questioning? Where's the Gideon-esque approach? Hey, Lord, let me go back to my tent and get my fleece. I'll be back here. You'd be thinking, if this is really what you want me to do, none of that goes on. Instead, look what the next verse says in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he split the wood, he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Verse 3 to me is where the rubber meets the road. God's instructed Abraham, ordered him, directed him to do something that seems so contrary, so illogical to everything that God had told him to do and had promised him for all these years and up until now. Kill the son of the covenant? I wonder how Abraham slept that night. Maybe that's why he got up so early in the morning so he couldn't sleep. Notice too that it was Abraham himself who saddled the donkey and who split the firewood to make the kindling for the sacrifice. Remember, Abraham was rich. He could have very easily ordered his servants to saddle the donkey and split the wood. Why didn't he? Go pull the car around front, servant. Go get the donkey. Split this wood. But he didn't do that. Why? Because this was personal. This was something that only he could do. It was between he and Yahweh Elohim. Where's the anger, though? Where's the resentment? Where's the questioning of God? All we see here is obedience. No questions. No griping. Just obedience. No tardiness, no tarrying. Just outright, abject obedience. Could you do this? Can I do this? I struggle with even taking a sick and dying dog to the vet to put down, much less being asked to take one of my son's or my daughter's life. I, I can't even begin to imagine. So far, I think Abraham's passing, passing the test with flying colors, isn't he? But guess what? The hard part's still coming. The question is, will Abraham finish strong? Well, let's see. Verses 4 and 5. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there. Did you see it? Did you notice it there in those verses? A clue pointing to the crucifixion of Jesus, the foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice that God the Father and Jesus the Son would make hundreds of years later. See it? On the third day, Someone may accuse me of spiritualizing this too much, but I believe that's significant. I believe it's a marker. I believe it points to the crucifixion, the reference to three days. Because for three days, think about this, Abraham had been walking towards the sacrifice being ordered by God to make of his son Isaac. For three days, I believe that Abraham had reckoned Isaac is already dead. Isaac was merely a dead man walking on the way to Mount Moriah because God had told Abraham to sacrifice him to kill him. And Isaac was indeed going to be dead. He was going to be a dead man at the end of those three days. For three days he held that fate. But we're going to see here in a minute that he escaped death on the third day just like Jesus escaped death on the third day. Hundreds of years later. How long would Jesus be in the grave? Three days. Also, uh, in this light, the pointing to the crucifixion, let's look at a couple of other things that have probably slipped by us that may not have picked up on. What do Abraham and God Almighty have in common? And what do Jesus and Isaac have in common? Both Abraham and God were fathers 
and they were asked to sacrifice, or they sacrificed their only sons. I don't know about you, but I can almost hear John 3.16 being recited in the background. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I can almost hear that as I read these scriptures and think about it. More of this as we move along, but let's look at verse 5 again. Abraham said to his young men, stay here and I and the lad will go over there. But what I omitted reading to you a few minutes ago, and it says, and we will worship and return to you. And we will worship and return to you. Whoa! What did Abraham know that we're not told here? Abraham confidently says, we will worship and return to you. How can Abraham know that? That God would spare his son? Or, or had he reckoned it that if God would bring Isaac back to life? We won't take the time this morning, but that's what Hebrews 11 says over in verses 17 and 19, that he reckoned him as that God would bring him back from the dead if God wanted him dead. That's how much faith and how much trust that Abraham had in him. But one thing that we do know for sure from reading these verses is that Abraham's faith, faith was manifested in these verses. So in verses 6 to 8, we see Abraham take what I imagine is the longest walk of his life to the top of that mountain. Let's read on. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. You guys remember the movie The Green Mile? Tom Hanks took place during the Great Depression. He was a corrections officer. And the storyline is about how attached these correction officers got to those inmates on death row. And um, it was a powerful movie depicting of what I think about every time I read these verses about what those prison guards felt like when they were walking that guy to the death chamber. I I can't even fathom what Abraham must have been thinking about or how he must have felt. When I was DA, um, part of my job entailed witnessing the execution of any inmate that had been sentenced to death. And um, Kelly Lamont Rogers uh, was executed at Big Mac on March the 23rd, 2000 for the murder of a 21-year-old OSU girl that uh, he brutally murdered and raped. Uh, She was a pizza delivery girl, and when she delivered and knocked on his door, he brought her in and raped her and murdered her. And I was there when Kelly Lamont Rogers was executed. I was as close as from here to that music stand. Um, The DA and the warden sit on the very front row. And the the victim's family sits behind us. And the defendant's family sits in a room that's right next. They look straight on at him. And I, it was, it's an amazing story. It's, it, it, it's for another day, another message, or actually it's a testimony because there's a spiritual ending to that story I'll share with you sometime, but that's for another day. But suffice it to say, when I read these scriptures about Abraham being asked to offer, to sacrifice, to execute his own son, I think about Kelly Lamont Rogers. Well, where I'm going with all this is that we can only imagine how little strength that Abraham had left in his legs when he made that walk to where he would slay his son. Again, another part of Abraham's test. Verse 6 says that Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice on his back. In John 19, 17, we're told that Jesus carried the cross on his back. Coincidence? I think not. And in verse 7, Isaac cries out to his father, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? 
In Mark 15, 34, Jesus cried out to His Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Almost eerie, isn't it? The symbolism and the foreshadowing. And don't miss this. I just thought of this last night. Is Abraham carried what? The fire and the knife. Fire is a symbol of judgment. And the knife is a symbol of execution of judgment. And then what God did, and then what Jesus did on Calvary was judge sin, execute punishment. Well, we know from the verses here in Genesis that uh, Isaac had no idea of what God had directed Abraham to do because Isaac asked his father, well, where's the lamb for the offering? And clearly this is a paramount difference and a paramount distinction uh, in the typology because we know that unlike Isaac, who didn't know what was getting ready to happen, Jesus knew unequivocally what was going to happen to him. How many times do we read in Scriptures and the Gospels and His hour had not yet come? God, God had revealed. Jesus knew what the plan was. He marched to Jerusalem to be sacrificed. And we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, don't we? On the night of His arrest, where Jesus prayed so hard that He swept blood let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will, O oh God. But we see in Abraham's response to Isaac a deep faith and a trust that he had in God. And he responded to Isaac, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So how's Abraham doing so far? What do you score him? You give him an A so far? Well, it gets more intense. Let's read on. Verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, if you are an inquiring mind, like I know most of you are, when you get to that sentence, that verse, you go, he bound him and he put his son on the altar? And mercifully, one Bible scholar says, the Bible doesn't give us the conversation between Isaac and Abraham as he bound his hands and feet. However, I prefer to view the view, the other view, or another view is that Isaac was a willing participant. Obedient to his father Abraham. Just as no one put Jesus on the cross without His consent, remember we're told that there were 12 legions of angels at His beck and call. He could have stopped that crucifixion, and that trial in a, in a New York second. But instead, Jesus was obedient to His Father's will, and in, and in a sense, He crawled up on that cross. Or I guess the best way to say it is He allowed those men to put Him up on that cross. Similarly, I believe that Isaac was willing to follow his father's will. And I think this fits the typology, the symbolism, the foreshadowing of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus, which would come 2,000 years later. Remember, Abraham was an old man. And most Bible scholars agree that at the very least, Isaac would have been a young man. And some even think a middle-aged man. In fact, Tony and I had a debate on which picture you used, the one that... We put up there's one that that guy looks a little older than one of them we had uh, that had a, looked like a young boy. He was not a young boy. Personally, I wouldn't be surprised to find out when we get to heaven, as, if it's even relevant then, that Isaac was 33 years old. Just saying. Because that's how old Jesus was when he died on the cross for us. And now the moment of truth, verse 10. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay a son. Abraham's just about to cross the finish line. And look what God does. But let me ask you first, do you suppose Abraham's eyes were closed or shut as he got ready to plunge that knife into his son's heart? I don't know. But praise God for what we read in verses 11 and 12. But the angel of the Lord, and by the way, who is that? When you read angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. How fast do you suppose Abraham's response was this time? 
I bet it was a nanosecond. Where have you been? Thank you. Yeah, right on cue. Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. And look what the rest of verse 12 says, which I didn't read. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And so to prove to Abraham that God will indeed provide and has our best interests at heart, God gives us verses 13 and 14. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. I think we have here in these verses just another typology of foreshadowing of the cross and the crucifixion, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. Verse 13, And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the thorns. Notice it's a ram. A stinky old ram. Not a lamb. There's a difference. Who was the lamb? That was Jesus. And what did the apostle, not the apostle, what did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus one day? Behold, the Lamb of God. I don't remember how the rest of that verse goes, but it's something to the effect that who taketh away the sin of the world, I think, or something like that. That was reserved for Jesus. This typology stops short. What God provided was a ram. And I think it's also interesting to note that um, you ever think about the, his head was caught in a thicket? What did Jesus wear on the crown, on his head? In fact, it's in John 19, too, where we see that the soldiers twisted a crown together of thorns and put it on his head, on our Savior's head. So there's even a symbolism there. So back to Genesis, God's provision was so complete that um, he even made sure Abraham wasn't lying when he went back to the two men that were waiting for him on the other side of the mountain or down the hill, that Isaac and Abraham would worship over there on that mountain and return to them. Indeed, they did worship, didn't they? I can only imagine. It would be a good song, you know. I can only imagine (laughs) what the worship would have been like. I'm sure there were many a tear shed. Actions speak louder than words. When It's not about this sermon, but if you follow Isaac, what he learned from his father there, his relationship, played out in Isaac's life. But I'm sure that uh, there was worship and praise of joy and thanksgiving to the Lord who provides. And let's see how God grades Abraham's test. He does it right there on the spot. Look at verses 15 to 19. And he gives him his reward for passing this ultimate test of trust. It says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Oh man, there's so much symbolism there we just don't have time to go into. But in your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Who are we talking about there? Because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together on to Beersheba. And Abraham lived in Beersheba. Now, as Paul Harvey, you know, all those of you who know Paul, who Paul Harvey is, you realize there's a whole generation that doesn't know who Paul Harvey is. <laughs> but uh, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story, 2,000 years later, at this very spot, on this very mountain, which would later be named Mount Zion, and where the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem, is, where the temple would be built, where the Dome of the Rock is now, and the new temple will be built there. Mark it down. Scripture says that. God the Father, 2,000 years later, was going to send His Son, Jesus, to the cross as a sacrifice for your sins and for mine. 
But this time, God wouldn't withhold the sacrifice. Jesus would be and was slain for us. Does this help us see more vividly John 3.16 and the love that God has for us? All the Bible from Genesis to Revelation points to our Savior Jesus. Here on Mount Moriah, God intervened in Abraham's life with Isaac. Here on this same mountain, 2,000 years later, guess who God intervenes for? You and me. He intervened with Jesus, our Savior. Do you know Him? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? That's what He was trying to show us, what God wants us to see through Abraham. The test question, the quiz for you and me is, what in your life is more important than your relationship with God? Is it money? Is it material things? Is it your job? Is it school? Is it pleasure and entertainment? Is it your status? If the answer to that question is not unequivocally, nothing is more important to me than my relationship with God, then you're not ready for the final exam. I'm not either. I'm not standing up here on a high horse saying I'm, I could pass it. I couldn't. What do you do when you're not ready for a final exam? You get back to the book. You get back to the book. You study God's Word. And He gives you that faith that transcends seeing. So, as I ask the worship team to come forward, we're going to pray in just a moment. If you, and I look out, I know that most people here have turned their lives over to the Lord, surrendered their lives to Jesus. You never know, though. And it's certainly not my goal to try to cause you to doubt your salvation through this series of messages. But if you can't answer that question like you want to, my guess is you'll have serious doubts about your salvation. So feel free to come forward this morning. I'll be down here at the front. Or you can come down here and pray. If you want to, uh, me to pray with you or some other men. And If you want somebody to mentor you, you need somebody to walk this journey with you, come down here and Crawford and I, or we'll find somebody to hook up with you to help walk. And for those of us who have the opportunity to disciple some people, you know who grows just as much as the people we're discipling? We do. So it's a continual journey for us. So let's pray.